You know, the song says it best. You know the song. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And for me, it is. And it's not about getting stuff. Frankly, I'm at an age and point in life when I don't need anything I don't already have. And I really don't even want anything that I don't already have. Now, my wife and adult children complain that I'm impossible to buy for. Because if there's something that I think would be useful, I just go ahead and get it. Must be some folks like that in the audience, too. (laughs) But for me, Christmas is simply not about getting anything. Because I've been given the greatest gift of all. The undeserved, unearned, and utterly unlimited love of God. And I'm aware that a lot of people... I'm aware a lot of people just don't like me. (laughs) Mostly because my political views aren't the same as theirs. And so they make it personal. And not much I can do about that. But it really doesn't ruin my day because those who spew hateful things toward me are mostly people I just don't know. And there are people who don't know me personally either. So why should I lose sleep over that? Here's what gives me a great sense of affirmation. That the God who really does know me and who in fact created me, he does love me. He knows my sins, my flaws, my inconsistencies. He knows all my mistakes. And he still loves me, more than even the people in my own family. Now, they know a lot of my flaws, although, thank goodness, not all of them. And I value and I cherish their love and forgiveness, but God knows everything. And yet, he still loves me. And that's my most precious Christmas gift. He who knows me best loves me most. What more could I hope for? Oh, I still enjoy giving Christmas gifts to my children and grandchildren and to friends and to my church. But most of all, I enjoy giving to people who are complete strangers and who are unable to reciprocate with a gift to me. It's the kind of gift that I think most resembles God's gift to me. Not prompted by some favor done or a service hoped for or even some payback for a good deed that was performed. Just something given out of sheer grace. After all, that's how God loves me. And if I can show love to another who can do nothing in return, I think it's as close on earth to a gift from heaven as we can give. So rather than fretting over what to give someone who doesn't need a thing or worrying about whether the wrapping is attractive, my suggestion, do something that I promise will be more fun. Here it is. Give an outrageous tip to a server. Not a good one but an outrageously generous one that might just make that person have enough to provide the entire Christmas for his or her children. And while filling up your car with gas, go over to another person's pump and simply pay for their fuel. Hey, with Bidenomics, that may be almost as big as paying off their mortgage, okay? (laughs) And if you're in the line of the grocery store, tell the checker to put the groceries of the person in front of you on your charge. Yeah, walk up to a total stranger in a store on the street and simply hand them a $100 bill or whatever you can afford and just say, God bless you and Merry Christmas. Of course, if you're in Washington, D.C. or New York City or Chicago, uh, you won't have to offer it. People will come up and ask you for (laughs) all your money and just treat it as a Christmas gesture. By the way, people aren't used to being given something that they totally didn't expect. And if they ask you why you're doing it, just tell them that 2,000 years ago, God loved you and there was no reason to. And when you didn't earn it or deserve it, but just because he loved you and sent Jesus so that he could show you that kind of love. My favorite Christmas gifts are not the ones I get. It's the ones I give. And the best ones I give are the ones that the person receiving doesn't expect or even deserve. And that is what makes it the most wonderful time of the year. Well, it's a gift to be with all of you tonight, and Keith Bilbrey is going to let us know what's coming up around the bend. Keith, take it away. 
Well, coming up next, Kristen Day talks about her fight to keep the pro-life movement part of the Democratic agenda. And later, you've never seen so many horns in one place. It's Vinny and the Hitman, all tonight on Huckabee. MikeHuckabee.com and sign up for his free newsletter and follow at GovMikeHuckabee on X. And welcome back. Kristen Day has been involved in every level of political activity since her days as a student at Michigan State. She's worked in campaigns as well as in the official offices of elected officials from the local level, to serving as a chief of staff or a U.S. congressman. And throughout her endeavors, two things have been consistent in her political life. She's pro-life, and she's unapologetically a Democrat. She is now the executive director of the Democrats for Life, the author of Democrats for Life, Pro-Life Politics, and the Silenced Majority, which was published by New Leaf Press back in July of 2006. Her book outlines the history of the pro-life Democrat movement, we're very proud to have her with us. I'm grateful that she would come. Please welcome Kristen Day. Kristen, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me on. I genuinely admire you. I've told you this before, but you're a real hero to me. And I don't have a lot of Democrat heroes, so you're one of them. But it, it's because you have the conviction of being pro-life in a party that used to have a lot of pro-life people elected and not many anymore. And I appreciate the fact that you're sticking with your party, but you're also sticking with your principles. Yes. Is it harder than it was 10 years ago? It has, it is harder. But at the same time, there are so many pro-life Democrats out there who just keep me going. Because I think about, you know, this fight that we're in. And I think about maybe I should stop this fight and then I'll get a phone call or an email or I'll see someone and they'll, they're grateful for our organization keeping this fight going and trying to protect the most innocent. Well, I think all of us who are in the pro-life world, whether we're Democrat or Republican, have to be grateful for what you're doing. Uh, but, but I really do remember a time when there were a lot of Democrats and not just folks outside of the political circles, but elected legislators, even members of Congress in the Senate, and they were unapologetically pro-life. What changed? What was it that was the turning point that kind of just... It was a gradual thing. It wasn't something that just happened overnight. It was gradually we pushed these pro-life Democrats out of the party until the situation we're in now where we have Senator Joe Manson who's leaving the Senate, yeah. who was the only voice, vo voice for life in the Senate. And uh, we have one in the, in the House side, Henry Quayer. Yeah, who, a good man. Good, uh, good very man. good man. So, and... I think what is encouraging, though, are we, are we are continuing to see pro-life Democrats run around the country and in states and make diff a difference in the states. Um, like Katrina Jackson uh, from Louisiana is yeah. a senator there, and uh, young re uh, Representative Trina McGee up in Connecticut, who is just an uh, amazing hero uh, for me. She's 26, uh, she elected in a, a special election. Yeah. First speech she gave was about being pro-life. She changed uh, 17 people to vote against an abortion bill in Connecticut. We need to get her on our show. Yes, Talk to her. she is amazing. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I mean, right now, 16 attorneys general who are Democrats, um, they're banding together to declare crisis pregnancy centers as being guilty of misleading people. That hurts because most of these centers are not political, and they provide diapers, they provide... Uh, formula, they provide clothing and classes and all kinds of assistance. They're not just trying to keep people from an abortion. They really are into whole life and they care about the prenatal care of the mother and the postnatal care of the mother. Why are they attacking people that are serving at no cost to the clients? I don't understand that. The way I explain it to a lot of people is that they are, the abortion industry is a corporation and they yeah. own the Democratic Party. And so these attorneys generals and other Democrats are trying to shut down competitors who will take people away from 
getting abortions. Yeah. And, and it will hurt their bottom line if people actually, women actually have the opportunity to choose to have their babies. Uh, and another uh, one is Congressman Josh Gothheimer from New Jersey. He stood in front of a pregnancy center in New Jersey in his district and basically outlined the same things that these attorney generals did. And I talked to the center and I said, has he ever been in? Did he ever visit the center to see what good work you do? Yeah. And the answer was no. He never called. He never made a visit. He never did, you know, learned what they do. So we did send him a letter. Uh, we hand delivered it to him, uh, asking him to come and visit the pregnancy right. center with us. And to date, he has not responded. Uh, so anybody in his district, I encourage you to call him and uh, encourage him to join Democrats for Life in visiting some pregnancy centers to really understand the good work that they do. And even if he didn't embrace the sanctity of life as a worldview, which I wish he would, I don't know how people can't, but to go see what is done at the crisis pregnancy centers, I mean, I've spoken to probably scores of them across the country in their fundraising banquets and other events, and I've never been to one that did not provide incredibly helpful services to the moms and to the babies without any cost, and they didn't try to get them to be Republicans. They didn't try to get them even to be pro-life. They just, they just loved them and loved those mothers as well as the babies, which I think is so important wow. that we show that we're not against the moms. We're really not. We don't want to criminalize mothers. We don't want to uh, go after them. We want to hug them, love them, affirm them, help them. I mean, that's really the, the, the whole of the pro-life movement. Yeah, so I'd like to add a point to that and that a lot of these centers, most of them also provide uh, post-abortive healing and counseling. Yes, So they, they love the mother regardless of what choice she makes. And I think that's the key point here, choice. If the Democratic Party is pro-choice, yeah. why are they shutting down a choice? And I've been calling it the one choice party because a, they, they right. only want abortion as the, the choice. The only one and choice. All, the only choice. Now, one of the things you have uh, said is that there are up to 21 million Democrats in the country who are pro-life. Are they afraid to speak out? What, what's happening? They really are. There's tremendous pressure and just um, it's mean-spirited and yeah. uh, not uh, from the abortion lobby. They're, they're not very... Uh, opening and welcoming and uh, into the, you know, the Democratic Party, we're supposed to be the party of diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, if you even hint that you want to protect life in the womb, even at 22 weeks, even at 20 weeks, you're, you're a persona non grata and um, not welcome in the party. And Kristen, on a personal level, I mean, you pay a price to take the stand that you do. Um, you have people who vilify you because you're not a loyal Democrat, right? but you obviously are. The, the question is, this is not a convenient position for you to take. It's got to be deeply personal. What is the origin in your own life, your own heart? What makes you stand so strong, courageously for life, when it would be so easy to just sort of slip back and let it go? Yet I wasn't raised to be a pro-life advocate. You know, it wasn't something that my family talked about. Hmm. Uh, you know, I really, it was just something in me that I knew, I knew that, you know, life began in the womb, mm -hmm. uh, even in college. And, uh, and it wasn't until I went to work for Congressman Jim Barsha from Michigan. Mm. And I walked into the office and I was the new legislative assistant. And um, I was the new person, so I had to handle the issues that nobody else wanted to handle. And I learned that he was pro-life. And then I thought, wow. I can be pro-life and a Democrat. Because I always knew deep down that what my party was pushing for with this woman's right to choose was wrong. Mm. Uh, and it just reaffirmed when I had my own children to this. Um, I actually lost my first baby to a miscarriage. Mm. And, you know, it was a loss. Yeah. And, um, and you just realize just how precious that life is. And having three more children, uh, you know, you just, it's, it's an amazing gift. Uh, and I think another thing that, that keeps me going on this fight is talking to the women mm. uh, and men post-abortive who yeah. weren't blessed to make that decision. They were um, pushed into this other decision that they lost their children. And I just want to fight to give every woman uh, and every family that chance. Well, Kristen, it may sound odd that I would say, I hope you remain a Democrat. <laughs> I really do. As much as I'd love to see you part of the Republican Party as I am. The reason is, is because I think your voice is incredibly important. 
Because I don't want the abortion issue to ever be a partisan issue. It shouldn't be. It ought to be an issue of civilization, an issue of human rights, and it ought to transcend everybody's party. You're one of the few voices that help us get there. And I just want to say not only thank you for your stand, thank you for being with us. I hope that America prays for you, and we pray for your success in continuing to keep the torch lit for the unborn. God bless you. Oh. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you want to learn more about Democrats for Life of America, and if you want to follow Kristen Day and read her always thought-provoking articles, if you go to Huckabee.tv, we will connect you with her and her publications. Right now, Keith Bilbrey is going to tell all of you exactly what's coming up next. Up next, Rabbi Haim Mintz comforts Israeli villagers in the midst of war. Then later, an inside scoop on the marvel of the F-35 military aircraft. Okay, Trey Corley, you've been cleared for takeoff. I love the music from the Charlie Brown Christmas as we come back into the segment. Well, Rabbi Haim Mintz is the rabbi of Shabbat of Bel Air, a top-rated radio talk show host on KFI in Los Angeles. He's led many tours of Israel in the past, but he recently led a very different kind of mission. He took 27 American rabbis to visit victims of the October 7th atrocity who were at hospitals and army bases, as well as visiting with soldiers and everyday Israelis who were forced to flee their homes. Here to share his firsthand observations and experience, what an honor to welcome Rabbi Haim Mintz. Rabbi, great to have you Thank here. You. Thank you. It's a true pleasure. Thank you. I, I would like to think that the entire world was gut-punched by what happened October the 7th. It didn't matter who it would have happened to, it would have been horrible. But the fact that it happened to Jews in their homeland, their homeland of 3,500 years, who have been through a Holocaust, and the whole world said, never again. And then we saw it again. I can't imagine the pain within our friends in the Jewish community. You went there with 27 other rabbis, and I want you to, to describe what did you see? What did you feel? The moment we heard what happened, it was on the happiest day of the year, a day that we really celebrate the holiday of dancing with the Torah and being proud that we're Jewish. All of a sudden, I get an email from one rabbi who said, we got to do something. And everybody said, let's do it. We got on a plane literally immediately, hmm. and we, we just turned to our community, help us with funds. People gave funds, we went. And I got to tell you something, the streets were empty. Hmm. People were nervous. People were like, what's going on? But the, I got to say the first thing, Governor, getting off the plane, we went straight to the hostage families. They were told these Chabad rabbis are coming from, his, from America to see you. They all came. Hmm. And I got to tell you something. What do you do when you walk into a family where they're lost, they, mm -hmm. they can't see their daughter or their husband, their, their mother, their... We smiled, we sang, we spoke, we mm. heard, we uplifted, we danced, mm. we prayed. Then we went to hospitals, people with soldiers with their hands off their hand, from their shoulder, no legs. One lady, she was a model. She picked up an Uzi and was just shooting away. She killed 20 soldiers, mm. but she kept on shooting, but she had seven bullets. But she's mm. literally right now with a bullet near her spine. Oh. So she was in a hospital that you, she can't move. But she was so like, we walked in, her mother and father are crying, what's gonna be with my daughter for the rest of her life? And all of a sudden you come in and you say, we're here for you. I gotta tell you something, and you know this governor, mm. one good deed, we say just do one good deed and it takes away a lot of darkness. Mm. Let me tell you something, governor. You've been saying it on this show, you know it. 
I walked into it, the darkest hospital rooms. Mm. And within about 30 seconds, that negative, that sadness. And they look at us and they go, you're here mm. from America? Yeah, mm. I came to see you. And all of a sudden, that room is so lit. They're laughing for the first time in maybe two, three days a week. Mm. I came back. I did an interview on Fox News. And they, they loved what I had to say because I go to my computer. Within two days, from all over America, non-Jewish people started donating $25, $50. You have no idea. Thousands of dollars came in. Go back there. Help them. Buy them. With the money that came from non-Jewish people, we were able to buy an entire battalion. Helmets. And, uh, and protective gear, which costs almost $1,500 because the plates and everything. Yeah. And it all came from non-Jewish people all across America. So the first thing I want to say to you, what happened in Israel? It was a gut punch. Yeah. Remember Mike yeah. Tyson? Yeah. He went down. Mm. If you got punched, you went down. Israel got up. Mm. And boy, are they getting up. Mm. And they are so united, whether they're conservative or they're liberal. They know one thing, there's an evil, and we're going after it. And we thank everybody around the world, and I thank all of you, mm. because this, it's your audience, it's all these people that literally help us. And I think our audience truly understands that God has put his hand on Israel. Yes. And the Jewish people. Yes. And it is our responsibility. It's not just, it's not a privilege, it is that, but it is our responsibility to stand with our Jewish friends and not let them feel like that they are alone and they have no one in this world. But the needs are extraordinary, Rabbi. I'm yeah. thinking about how many thousands and thousands of people have been dislocated from their homes because rockets have been shelled all over their neighborhoods. Hamas has destroyed many of the places that they called home. Yeah. So it's a long-term issue. It is a very long term. The hotel that we stayed in, um, the hotel that we stayed in had about 140 families mm. that they housed them. And here we were eating like pizza and we look and what are they eating? Mm. They don't have the, these people don't have the money to just all of a sudden buy breakfast, lunch, and supper. Mm. A couple of those rabbis, we went and said like this, we have the money from America. We went out and bought out stores and saying, guys, mm. open up your pizza stores, give a party to this place. <laughs> wow. We rented a band, we was playing, we were singing and dancing with them. You know, it's a long-term program. It's a yeah. long term. This is not, first of all, the war's gonna be for a while. But even more so, these people, their lives. And you think it's just the families that are displaced? The mother and the father with these kids that don't have an arm. Mm. These kids, or this father, who, who's going to take care of the family when he was the breadwinner? But we are a good world. We are a beautiful world. And I love this world. I love humanity. And that's why, that's why when I ask, come in, I, I want you all to know. I don't know any of you, but you got to know how special it is to know as a Jew, you are all standing with me. Mm. You're standing with me. Yes, indeed. I, I, you know, you have already done something for me because it's hard for me to look at all the things that are happening, not only in Israel and the horrors they've been through, but then to see these people parading on the streets and taking up for Hamas, and I just don't get it. You bring hope and light to all of this in a perspective. And Rabbi, I want to say thank you for helping all of us to better understand that there is another chapter yet to be written, and it's going to be of how God will raise up once again his people. And I want to make sure that I'm on the right side of that. You're already on the right side. <laughs> I'm not worried about you. But you brought up a beautiful thing. Darkness is so evil, mm. so evil. Look at Germany today and look at Japan mm. today. Yeah. These two countries were all about destroying a democracy and goodness. They were destroyed in principle, but the people learned and they transformed into beautiful people. Yeah. There are beautiful Muslims out there, fantastic. But the ones that are preaching this hate, they're going to have to find either what happened to Germany and Japan 
or they're going to open up their eyes and their ears and learn. And I promise you all, I promise you all, just like after World War II, the world was a better place for Japan and for Germany, for the entire Middle East, the world will be a better place when the people that are bringing down the good people of the Arab world and trying to threaten the people on the streets of America and all the beautiful democracies, you know it as I know it, this is one of those moments in time where we go is, this is the taste of messianic, messianic mm. stuff mm. because the world is getting better because the world is gonna stand up to the negativity. Now I'm glad that I know why you're here <laughs> because you're giving us a real sense of perspective and Rabbi, I wanna say thank you. Thank you on behalf of every American who's wondered, what can we do? Is it hopeless? And you've reminded us, no, when God is involved, it's never hopeless. My friend, it has been an honor and a joy to have you with us and to share this great message of optimism that we desperately needed. Thank, thank you. you very, very much. And if you go to Huckabee.tv, we have links to Rabbi Mintz and to information about how you can help the people and defenders of Israel, including the many who had to flee their homes, just as he was discussing. You can lend your hand of help, and I hope that you will. Right now, Keith Bilbrey is going to tell us what we still have coming up on the show, and it's quite good. Well, after the break, Captain Tom Burbage talks about the groundbreaking technology behind the Lockheed Martin F-35. And later, trailblazing magician Anna de Guzman performs. Don't touch that dial. Every Christmas season, Samaritan's Purse collects millions of shoe boxes from all over the country, and they're filled with personal gifts for each child, and they deliver those boxes to less fortunate children all over the world who otherwise wouldn't receive anything, nothing, on Christmas morning. These children hear the gospel. They encounter the love of Christ in a spectacular way, and they can impact for generations just because of what they've received. If you have not already, I hope you'll consider joining the great mission and work of Samaritan's Purse. It's easy to do. You can visit the Samaritan's Purse website, or you can call the number that's on your screen. Thank you, and God bless. Well, as a former U.S. Navy test pilot, aerospace engineer, and project manager at Lockheed Martin, my next guest was directly involved in the most difficult, controversial, and expensive military project in history the F-35 Lightning II fighter jet. It's the most advanced military aircraft in the history of the world, and it's changed combat warfare for the United States and military efforts all over the world. He's the author of this riveting new book called F-35, The Inside Story of the Lightning II. Would you please welcome Captain Tom Burbage. Tom, good to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. A lot of people across the country, they know there's, there's a fighter jet called the F-35. They know it's been controversial. They know there were a lot of cost overruns. So tell us the good news of the F-35. When people look at a fighter or any airplane and they see two wings and two tails and an airplane's an airplane, but this is so much more than an airplane. It's actually had a huge role in redefining the aerospace and defense industry. Who were the major players in that? global supply chain around the world, which has brought um, you know, a lot of business and contracts to folks um, that have been participating in it. But more importantly, uh, we have never fought in the last 30 or 40 years a single service, either war fighting or peacekeeping operation or a single nation one. And this airplane brought forward the opportunity to actually bring those, those uh, entities that fly and fight together as one unit. Uh, talking to some pilots that I have known, who have flown the F-35, they say it's the most magnificent ever. There's never been anything like it, and they can't even compare it to an F-16 uh, or a, you know, an F-18 or anything else. Why is it so much more sophisticated than anything we've ever had before? The main reason is software. Huh. Uh, we, a lot's happened in the world of computers, and a lot's happened in the world of integrating software. When you're flying an F-35, you're basically watching the movie of everything around you. You're not trying to figure out who the actors are or who's getting the awards. You're watching the movie, so you don't even know what sensor is providing you information. You're just watching what's happening. So you have the, the extreme advantage of also being very difficult to see 
from the adversary's perspective. So you have the element of surprise and you have the element of situational awareness that are just unusual in this airplane. So there's a lot of stealth capacity built into the F-35. I know you were involved in the creation and the development of the F-22, the Raptor, which was kind of our premier stealth fighter, right. but this one takes it to a new level. The two airplanes are about 10 years apart in terms of when they froze their design. And that 10 years was uh, quite an amazing period of time during technology advancement, not just in computers, but a lot of the other sciences, particularly in the area of stealth, that go into this, making this airplane what it is today. Now this thing can fly on or off an aircraft carrier, but it can also hover and, and almost land like uh, the Harrier that we remember seeing. So, so there's so many different applications of the versions of the F-35. Um, all of our military, I guess it's, it's not just for the Air Force, not just for the Navy on the carriers. Right. All the branches that fly are able to utilize the F-35. Uh, that's correct. There's actually three different versions, uh, and the differences are only in the way they operate uh, in terms of takeoff and landing. If you sat in any one of the three, you wouldn't know the difference. They're exactly the same to the pilot. A great example of the benefit of it is the uh, Queen Elizabeth II is the UK's new uh, aircraft carrier. And it was recently in the Mediterranean. It had US Marine F-35Bs, UK, Italy, all flying off of a capital ship that doesn't belong to the United States and all flying the same airplane. Now, we just talked to the rabbi talking about what was going on in Israel. The Israelis are one of the people uh, who have purchased the F-35. They're using it. I, I'm sure you're getting reports. It may be one of the most significant times with the F-35 is actually being used in combat. What are the reports that you get back from the people who fly it and who fly it in actual missions? It's just a different, it's a different entity. You know, it, it, it brings a whole different dimension to the pilot in terms of what he sees, how he can operate, how he can penetrate into heavily defended areas. Um, there's a second category of countries First category being allies that fly and fight and maintain peace with us. Second one being those that are very important to us from a security perspective. Israel's one of the second group, as is Japan and South Korea. Um, after the Northern European uh, Russia invasion of Ukraine, a number of countries that are part of NATO joined the program. So we went from the, the eight nations that were part of it when I was working the program initially to now there's about 19. Now, in the, in the book, you, there's something that, that I was just blown away by, the technology. Nine million lines of computer programming in the F-35 to compare it to the Mars spaceship that were only two million lines. I mean, we're talking about an incredibly right. sophisticated piece of equipment. Right, right. And the lunar lander that landed, um, you know, we just celebrated yeah. its uh, 50th anniversary, I think, uh, has less software than my Apple Watch has in it. So, that's, that's phenomenal. So software has really changed the game in terms of the ability to uh, actually take the workload off the pilot and let the pilot be more of a tactician and, and mission manager than trying to understand what his various sensors are telling him. It, it's also one of the things in the book that I had not thought about. It was not just that you had opponents in Congress, but there were enemies of the United States that were doing everything they could to try to stop this. They didn't want this to happen, Russia, China, trying to hack into all of the uh, computer software systems that would have helped develop this? It was a challenge um, and, and one that we had to take extremely seriously, particularly since we had so many international partners that were part of the project. But um, it, it was done in, in uh, great security um, in terms of the classified parts of the airplane. And I think it was, it was done well. You can take a picture from space or from anywhere of an airplane on the ground and you can mimic what it looks like and some of the modern fifth gen fighters from our adversaries look sort of like ours <laughs> because they have high fidelity mm -hmm. photographs and they can see those things, but they can't see what's under the skin. You flew as a Navy test pilot for the uh, Navy on and off carriers. You were a Navy pilot, which uh, uh, certainly Navy people, and I think most people would say that's the toughest flying there is, that kind of flying. When you were flying in the 70s, did you ever envision there would be such a piece of hardware like this? No, the, uh, when I was flying, stealth wasn't even a, a known technology. It was, it was there, but it was very much in the closet still. So, so uh, you know, you really can't imagine the difference that this airplane gives you um, if you have to go in harm's way and you want to come home. Hmm. Well, that's one of the things I think we all want is all of our 
uh, right. people in planes to come home to get the bad guys and bring the good guys home. Tom, it's a fascinating book. It's called F-35, The Inside Story of the Lightning II, uh, the most sophisticated airplane that has ever been developed. And it's a must read for military and aviation buffs. F-35, The Inside Story of the Lightning II that we just talked about. And then if you want to know more about the book, go to Huckabee.tv. We have a link to get your copy of it, and I hope you will get it and uh, share it with uh, all of your pilot friends and military friends. And heck, read it yourself. You help pay for it, you ought to know more about it. That's for sure. Right now, Keith Bilbrey is going to very stealthily move like lightning to his podium, and he's going to tell us what's coming up on the show next. Well, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to stay right where you are. The magic of Anna de Guzman is next, so don't go away. This message will self-destruct right after the break. TV and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee mugs, t-shirts, and more. Well, our next performer is a trailblazing Filipina-American magician, mentalist, and cardist. That's a word, cardist. That means a master of card magic. And she's also one of the youngest members of the Magic Castle in Hollywood and the first ever female magician to make the final of America's Got Talent. I want you to give a big welcome to the amazing Anna de Guzman. Anna, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to be what here. What do you have in your box? I actually brought a little gift oh, okay. for you here today because it's actually my first time in Nashville ever. Ah, you're well, way overdue for a visit. Together. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Do we get to open the box? Not yet. Oh, okay. It'll be a surprise. But you need to guard it with your life, okay? With my life. Give it up for my beautiful assistant. Thank you. Perfect. Now, earlier, we handed the audience cards to write their names on it hmm. to make okay. it even more unique. So you can see I had the rabbi even sign a card. Very nice. Rabbi. Uh, Frankie, Sandy, Donnie, all sorts of names with people from the audience. Okay. okay. And mix them up. Have you ever seen someone handle cards like this? No, I have not. Would you play cards with me? No, absolutely not. <laughs> Don't but worry. The only person that, that might mess you up would be my wife because she cheats when she really? plays. Really? Yes. I need to meet her. So I don't play cards. Perfect. But you yep. can see they're all different. Yes. Go ahead and take one out and show everybody in the audience. Okay, just any card. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna cool. get that one. Show out everybody. Here. Hmm. Okay. Show everybody at home. I'm not peeking. You can't look. All Place right. Place it back into the deck. Anywhere, huh? Yes, anywhere you want, and you can even shuffle it. Oh no, there would be cards all over the stage if I okay. did that. So <laughs> they're good. They're all I'll just move them around a little okay. bit. Okay. There we go. Wow, okay. that's very impressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love. It. Think I get a job in Vegas? Probably not. I okay. can teach you. Here, <laughs> just look at me. Okay. Uh, think of the card. You, you remember all parts of the card. Um, start with the value of it. Um, I didn't remember all that. I just remember the name. You have one job. Just remember the card. <laughs> okay. It's I okay. remember the name. but It's okay. We have the audience here to help you out, correct? Okay. Did you guys okay. see it? Uh, so it's either red or black. It was red. It was red? Okay, he made it easy. Yeah. <laughs> he just told me what it was. So if it's red, it's... <laughs> This is going so well. <laughs> Boogered up her whole routine here. I didn't mean to do that. No, okay. you're doing great. It's red. Okay, yep. it's red. 50-50 shot of getting it right. So yep. if it's red, it's either got to be a heart or a diamond. And you have a big heart, Governor. Yes, I try. So I think it is a heart, correct? Sounds good. Yes, correct. was it? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it was a heart. I remember it well. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's like an even number here. Anybody who saw the card, say it to yourselves over and over and over again in your heads, all of you. Like four of hearts, 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 four of hearts. Is this the four of hearts? Correct? I don't know. <laughs> I know the name on the card. That's that. Okay. I know that. You know, what was the name on the card? You Susan. Susan. Okay, yes. just keep thinking of the name. Okay. That's fine. Don't even worry about the card anymore. No keep thinking of the name. Yes. Uh, we're going to come up with a couple things together. Okay. Uh, Keith. Yeah. Keith, hi. I have uh, this bag full of different color crayons. Mm. Uh, just 
Go ahead and reach in and grab one crayon for us. I, I know. Look, I have messed up the whole act. I didn't mean to. What okay. color did we get? What color is that? That would be pink. Oh, Keith. okay, pink. Yeah. Pink, yeah. pink. Good job. Keep I'm thinking of this color, okay? Yeah. Real men wear pink. Correct. That's right. Okay. okay. Keith, keep thinking of that color. Okay. I'll right. get back to you later. Thank you, Keith. Am I done? Yes. Keith. Most important job. Big role there, Keith. Man, wow. Don't know what we could do without you. Couldn't do it without Keith. And lastly, I have this mystery notepad that I wrote down a bunch of different uh, categories. I tried not to follow any specific um, pattern. It's like Apple, you know. Okay. Uh, Justin Bieber, a bunch of different things. Uh, Trey? Yeah. Hi, nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Thank you. I'm gonna hand you the notebook, hold it flat in your hands. Okay. In a moment, I'm gonna ha ask, you, ask you to lift up into a page, okay. look at the page, it'll tell you to think of something. Once you've got it, close the book, okay? But don't let anyone see. Try to remember what's in there. You know how it is yes. horrible when somebody is supposed to remember, <laughs> and they don't. <laughs> It's a good thing she gave me this and not crayons. That's better for kids. I know, totally. Keith, I, I, gave, I gave him an easy job. Okay. Got it? Got it. Lift up. Got one? Just lift up to one page. Yeah. Got it? It's only an hour show, Trey. Come on. <laughs> you know, so you're thinking of the name. Mm hmm What is the name? Susan. Susan, and you're thinking of the color. Pink, and you're thinking of something here no one could know of, correct? Correct. For the very first time, so that everyone here knows, what are you thinking of? A sloth. Sorry? A sloth. A what? A sloth. Like a worm, or? Like a, the... Yeah, I... Cartoons. You know, I'm... You know? Anything in the world. A sloth. I, I, Slowest animal in the world, yeah. I, hey. <laughs> You know, it's like slow? my first time in Asheville. Um, okay. Every night it's different because every audience is different, so there's no way I could have known that you would think of Susan, Pink, Sloth. a sloth. <laughs> you know. It doesn't always work, huh. but tonight it did. A pink sloth oh, yeah. named Susan? No way. No way. Look at that. Look at this. It says Susan. Can we see wow. that? Unreal. A pink you, you thought you had me for a second. I totally thought that we had absolutely <laughs> messed up <laughs> your magic. No, you can never mess and up And now magic. you've messed up our That's minds. That's for you. That's a sloth, huh? I feel very there you go. used right now. That was all you. You are the magic. That's amazing. Thank you so much for having me here. Wow. So happy to be here in Asheville. Okay. We've all been bamboozled. But if you want to see more of the amazing Anna de Guzman and to follow her on all of her social media platforms, just go to Huckabee.tv. We will connect you. Right now, Keith has a pink color over there, but he's got some Christmas magic coming up, and he's going to tell us all about it like right now. More horn players than you can shake a stick at as Vinny and the Hitman perform a Christmas classic next. Don't go away. Next week, join us as we bid farewell to 2023 with Dr. Phil and legendary comedian Rich Little. Well, tonight's musical guests are some of the top session musicians in Nashville. Now, they've played with hundreds of stars. I mean, ranging from Tony Bennett to Vince Gill to Leonard Skinner. But they also have a unique sound of their own led by a nine-piece horn section. Their new album is called A Public Domain Christmas. It's a blast to welcome to the show Vinny and the Hitman. Vinny, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Oh, thank you. This Joe. is awesome. Thank you. thank you very much. Okay, so... Public domain Christmas, what in the world does that even mean? Well, uh, you know, these songs are like uh, 400 years old, and once they get that old, the original writer uh, may or may not be alive anymore. Probably not. Yeah, probably. Yeah. So, so <clears throat> they become uh, of the public. And so we scooped them up because <laughs> we get to keep all the money. So you don't have to give that <laughs> to the publishers and all that stuff. So we're, we're super excited. That's a great record. So it, it's basically a way to grift 
for all these people. That's exactly right. And just take the dough. That's take the dough. Take yeah. the Christmas dough. You know what I'm saying? Well, good for you. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad. But, you know, it, it's some amazing things you've done with arranging some of the most familiar songs we've ever heard. And I think our audience is going to be blown away. I hope so. Now, these guys have played, I mean, with everybody. I mean, some of have played live with Taylor Swift. Yes. But also uh, Leonard Skinner, George Jones. I mean, there's probably nobody hardly in the music business of any musical genre that somebody here hasn't played with. If you listen to the radio or Spotify or any of those platforms, you've probably heard one of us play at one time or hmm. another. Yeah. Who, who's the most fun you've ever played with? Uh, that would have to be Steven Tyler. He was like, wow. uh, do you remember the Tasmanian Devil that came into the room and just, you know? Yeah. He was, he was absolutely incredible. We did a record with him down in Muscle Shoals, yeah. In Muscle Shoals. Yeah, and he was this close to my face singing horn licks to me. He was like, and I was like, I don't know what what's happening right now, but yes, I, you know, I played, and it was, oh, it's fantastic. How cool is that? I mean, all of you guys have some phenomenal stories. I wish we had time to hear them all. But one of the stories I love is that your mother watches this show. She does. My mom, Jerry Shashelsky. Hi, Mom. Um, and, and she... She is a huge, she's a, a huge Governor Huckabee fan, and she always tells me, because I've been on the show before, she always yeah. says, you know, make sure you give him a hug and a kiss. So I'm going to ask you for a hug, but I'm going to pass on the kiss. Let's pass on the kiss. I, I do the hug. <laughs> I'll hug Benny. I ain't kissing him. No, I ain't doing it. All right, Keith Bilbrey, while the band and I get ready to play, I want you to tell our viewers how they can get the fantastic new album, and they're going to want it when they hear it. A public domain Christmas. Tell us how, Keith. Well, just go to Huckabee.tv for a link to their album and their website and social media pages. And to watch an exclusive performance of Angels We Have Heard on High.